we started out, my own background is in chemical engineering, followed by <coughs> um, material science. And I've spent the time really looking at the decay mechanisms of stone, historic stone, the effects the environment has. And I, we, we kind of stayed away from being architects because we felt architects were our prime target, if you like. And uh, I realized early on in my life that architects don't like to be told by other architects what to do. <laughs> so <laughs> we put our title in as science and, um, and, and we really do. And we were, we were very lucky that uh, I was a, an external researcher with Trinity College in Dublin at the time. And they had a system called Campus Company where they gave us a room, a telephone, a mentor, but they keep 6% share in your company if you stay on campus for one year. It then incrementally increases if you stay on campus. And then the dividends that come from us goes into the college to fund other kind of startups. And things. So it's actually a good system. But we were lucky we were successful off campus, so we did come off campus. But that 6% share home that they still own in my company gives us kind of faculty status. So I can go into any laboratory in, in Trinity College and get concrete and analyzed, get stone analyzed, go into the environmental and sciences lab, get analysis. And the only people that have kind of preference over us are students. So any commercial are behind us because we're seen as a faculty. So uh, it, it's pretty amazing. And um, it, it's, I think it's part of the success of, of Carrie that we were able to do that because we don't then have to charge silly prices to get analysis done. Um, and then we kind of, uh, as Philip said, I got involved in, in very heavily involved in ECOMOS and I became the president of their International Scientific Committee on Energy, Sustainability, and Climate Change. And <clears throat> that then opened other avenues such as the, the EM standard that we wrote. But then from that, I got an invite to get involved with the Fraunhofer Institute of Building Physics in Germany. And I'll go through a bit of that later on. We then, I then got kind of fed up um, about six or seven years ago, reading yet another report on heritage from KPMG or PwC uh, accountants that know nothing about heritage. And uh, so we decided to set up our own little research. So we now have about four people employed just solely in uh, research and, and research studies. I think, you know, I, I'm realizing from my trip to New Zealand and here that we're very lucky in Europe because the EU has a massive research fund that we can apply to uh, for serious funding. Uh, I think we have three applications in at the moment for this year, and, and not just to us, but to the groups. And it's three different groups that's made applications, and it's a total of about 15 million euros. So it's serious kind of research uh, funding, which is great. And um, as I say, the Fraunhofer, what happened was there was a building, um, a, a monastery in a place called Benedict Boyron, which is about an hour and a half out of Munich towards the Alps. And <clears throat> this building was built in 1720. It was um, built or designed for 2,000 uh, religious and 1,000 lay people. So it's a town. And I'll show you a picture in a minute. But, um, when we went to first look at this at about 2014, uh, there were seven elderly monks wandering around this complex, and most of them on Zimmer frames because they were well into it in the 90s. And I've been there early, um, late last year. There's still only now two left, but they're, they're given accommodation in the, in the complex. The uh, Benedictine order gave the complex to the German government to get rid of their liability, their responsibility. And the German government then started repurposing some of the buildings. And it's really is worth a visit. There are two or three of the big 
dormitories are now hostel, youth hostels, so that people go and then they go climbing and go walking in, in the Alps. Um, and then because people started coming back into the complex so that people took smaller buildings, and there's now a problem, two restaurants, and the church is converted into a museum. But the German government gave the plan offer one of the buildings as a test laboratory, and now we call it a live laboratory. And I, I'll go through that a bit. Um, <clears throat> other, you know, I, I said about the EN, and then working with ICOMAS, the Climate Change and Heritage Work Group, we've produced some good documents. And now there's uh, this new organization over the last three years called the Climate Heritage Network, which is worth kind of uh, following and joining. Uh, it's, I don't think, it, 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 for members, it's free, but obviously companies like us make donations to it to, to fund it. Um, <clears throat> This is a statement that I think is, is very kind of apt and, and important. And um, that no community, culture, regional type of heritage is immune, immune from climate risks. And we do really need to do something about it. I also love the title of, of the organization, the Union of Concerned Scientists. I think it's, it, it's a wonderful name. Um, this is one of the Climate Heritage Network's documents, the impact of climate change on cultural heritage, and it is a human, an urgent human right. And that's also a very good document. This is one that ICOMOS wrote called The Future of Our Past. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a lengthy document, but um, what I can do, Philip, I can send you links to, to these um, so that you can uh, share them with and participants, um, but it's it's too big a, a document to email. So, um, <clears throat> the Irish government in um, about 2013-14 decided that they wanted to do something about climate change. And we're kind of lucky that we have a coalition government at the moment. So we have kind of two centre parties, which are the two biggest parties in Ireland. And then they're shored up and actually hold the balance of power of the Greens. And the Greens have really been driving the whole climate action side. And so the government released this document called the National Adaptation Framework. So it's, it's, a, it's a major framework document, which they then sent out to 12 different departments to actually do their own um, sectoral plans and we were lucky enough to uh, win the one that came out for built and archaeological heritage. Again, I can send you links to this, and it is in the public domain, so it's, it's shareable. And <clears throat> we looked at uh, the sectoral adaptation plan. And out of that, there's a number of objectives that we realized are important. One we've already uh, kind of started, which is the training and, and, and upskilling of people. But also, um, we've now been appointed by the Irish government to actually implement, because they don't have the internal resources, uh, hum human resources. Or, uh, so they go out to tender. We won the next phase of that. So we're now actually implementing the first <coughs> four I think, objectives, which is great because it gives us continuity of learning from doing the initial document and now having massive stakeholder meetings, consultations, uh, public consultations, and local community consultations, because we do believe this has to be a bottom-up approach. And, uh, and, and get everybody's opinion. Um, one of the objectives uh, was to come up with a, a, a specific set of guidelines for um, traditional buildings in Ireland. We've kind of steered away from heritage, using the word heritage, because um, most people outside our sector think of heritage as, you know, uh, Windsor Castle or, you know, Buckingham Palace or something like that. Whereas <clears throat> we want to aim at, at the ordinary stuff that's 
on campus here, that's on many campuses around. And um, so we have we've completed this document. It was then sent to the legal department within the housing or at the moment heritage. We often refer to heritage as past the parsec because every time there's a government reshuffle or a new government, heritage goes somewhere else. And at the moment, it's in the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. And it's actually sitting quite well there. Um, but they don't have the, 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 um, the resources to do this. So they cannot tender. We want that. We're, we've completed this document. It's now in the legal department just having a bet to make sure we're not making commitments that the government can't kind of commit to. That. Um, and it's due to be published in August. But as soon as it is public, I like can let Jeff and Philip know. And again, it will be a public document, so it's, it's useful. This is Benedict Boyron that I mentioned earlier. And this is the complex. And the little ring around a small building down the other end is actually what's called the cooperage, which is where they made the barrels to make the wine that Benedictines are well known for. And it was unused for about a hundred years, we reckon. And although the roof was reasonably secure, the building itself was in pretty poor condition. And this is the one that the German government gave to the farm. And this is it when we went to first see it, and you can see a lot of the line render has failed. And we tested it around the rest of the building. It had, it had all passed its sell by date. So we started uh, looking at this building and seeing what we could do. And we decided that what, it, what would be best is to convert a number of rooms within the building and then treat the envelope with, uh, as a major research project. And we brought in about 12 of the major suppliers in Europe of products that we felt either could be used in heritage buildings should be used or could be adapted to be used in heritage buildings. And the big one, as Philip said, is, um, you know, if you, you these buildings, I, I'm not fond of the word, but they're kind of, they're called breathable. Uh, we call them open pore structures, so moisture moves in, out, and out. And if you block that capacity of movement, you're creating major problems because you're changing the whole physics of the wall. So if you were to stick polystyrene insulation on the outside of this building, you know, it really would not perform well. So we looked at a, a number of things and what we did in the end was we uh, took off all the external uh, line render. Now it, it, it was an average about 42 mil thick um, and we didn't want to change any of uh, you know the, the sections where it comes to window jams or comes to the roof or the door. So we wanted to go back with a 42 mil. Um, and I don't know if this is the mess work on this. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah. Um, I do need to actually move it. <laughs> um, so Anyway, the, let's start with the one on the right hand side facing this way with the three windows. We took the lime off and we just put back ordinary lime NHL 3.5, natural hydraulic lime 3.5 with a sand mix. We did analyze the, the render that we took off to get the exact particle size and also the ratio of line to, to aggregate. And we put back um, a 42 mil line. And before we did that, we took uh, U value. We have all our own testing equipment where we put a widget on the outside, a widget on the inside, and we monitor that over seven days so that we can get the true U value instead of using a calculated one from a, a, you know, a software um, tool. So we did it before we removed the line render. 
after we removed the line lander just at the stone. And then we did it when we uh, did all the repairs. That one was lime. The front one was lime and hemp mixed <coughs> and act as a, an insulative um, kind of render. And then on this one with the three windows, um, we did lime and cork, um, which again, you crush cork and it's mixed with the lime. And then the one facing us with the single window and, and little slots that we did with a product called Aerogel, which was designed by um, NASA to protect the things coming back through the atmosphere. So it's a pretty good instant time. So we wanted to try that. And um, so very simply, the, the lime on, the, on its own by upgrading the lime, it improved the U value of that wall by 10%. The cork and the hemp work pretty similarly around 35% improvement, but the aerogel was giving us about 75% improvement. Now it is very expensive, and so you wouldn't be going uh, rendering very large sections with it, but this is part of an exercise to come up. And then inside, um, we did uh, use different systems inside. Normally, uh, or traditionally, it's been plasterboard since the uh, 1900s. That's a gypsum-based product, which is closed, which doesn't allow moisture. Uh, but now we have what's called a calcium board, which is actually made from lime. And that does allow moisture moving through it. And again, it comes in the same form as plasterboard, and it's about, you can get it, I think, 12 millimeters or 15 millimeters thick. So we've used that as, as just on the internal face. As you can see, we have all the widgets that Crown Walker are great with. And these are measuring CO2 measures, air movement, temperatures inside humidity, all this. So we're recording all this information every 15 minutes uh, in these different rooms. And then we have different levels of insulations. Uh, in, in another room, we have wood fiber board. Uh, we have actually got one with uh, polystyrene because we want to prove how bad it is. Um, and then we use different systems for uh, insulating floors or heating floors <coughs> for general heating. And we, we've also got a room just heated by electricity because if we ever get to the stage where our national grids are completely renewable, then electricity might be a, a good solution uh, because it's less intrusive on particularly the stark fabric inside. So we want to have all those answers. And, and <clears throat> we're even playing with aerogel mixing, <coughs> mixing it with a paint. And so that if you put a five mil paint on an, a very important interior, that you would gain a thermal efficiency. And that's too soon to, to have any results on, uh, but it's certainly promising. I think what we're all looking for is thermal comfort, and whether that's heating or cooling. And I know you understand here, it's probably more cooling than heating. The cooling actually is more damaging to the environment. But if we can learn from what we're doing with heating in Europe, we can convert it into cooling and therefore make it much more uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, obviously, high thermal movement, uh, moisture movement, we're monitoring all that because before we put the line renders back, we put double widgets in the wall to measure where the dew point is. Is it moving? Is it, is it stable? Because they're all important. Um, this is a um, a case study for uh, a building in Trinity College in Dublin. And this is the college that we're affiliated to, but we had to win this one on, on, on uh, tender. And within the EU, anything over 500,000 has to be advertised in the EU. So you could have uh, companies from 28 countries for jobs in Dublin. But anyway, we were lucky we won this one. The red brick is the front of the building. This is a historic photograph of the back of the building. 
we knew from our historic research that in 18, uh, 70, uh, 1894, they actually put an extra floor on and uh, changed the, the, the size of the building. Um, but it, it is a, we call them protected structures. We don't have the kind of English system of listed. Uh, if it's a protected structure, and we've had a lot of us say it's too far because we didn't have actually protection of our built environment until 1999, which is quite spectacular in European terms. And, but what the government did at the time was look at what the best practice, and then they kind of turned it up a bit and implemented it in Ireland. So we probably have the most protected um, structure in, in Europe. And uh, it's called a protected structure. And we have a ridiculous situation where a lovely um, Georgian house had a big garden and it had a shed down the back. And because the shed was in the curtilage of protection, it was protected. So we had to go through uh, un unlisting the building and then applying the plan. It's just, it's, it's a bit crazy. They are reviewing it at the moment and hopefully it will. But then we also have recorded monuments and structure, which this is anything pre 1700 in Ireland is actually automatically a recorded monument. And that means you have to go through a different statutory process. So we have to do the both of them in parallel. Um, <clears throat> it's obviously a, a, a landmark building. Yeah, 1699, it was designed for um, emeritus professors and visiting lecturers. Uh, so it's always been in residential use. It was designed by the Severe General then Thomas Berg, who is quite a quite a famous architect in, in, in Irish terms, and, and it's the oldest surviving building on the campus. There were older buildings, but they were demolished in the early days to make room for bigger buildings. Um, <clears throat> the client's objectives, and this is um, Dean, you were saying that you know it's the kind of the estate's office that runs buildings over here. We actually have something similar. It's called the buildings and the estate's office, and <clears throat> there's different directors. So the guy that was doing this was director of capital projects because it was a capital expense, and um, whereas we also deal with the director of conservation who's just doing conserving buildings, and then you also have now a sustainability officer who is now pushing to, to do sustainability. Um, the client's objectives is comfortable accommodation for fellows and students. Uh, there's now a major bum fight on from students to try and get rid of this building because there's very limited space. It was a low carbon project, a uh, sustainable heating uh, system, and then all new electrics, obviously, kitchens and bathrooms, appropriate ventilation, which ventilation is the kind of important word in many of this work. And then of course we have to apply, comply with fire safety, which is often a challenge in, in some of these buildings, more so than conservation. Um, <clears throat> so that's the back of the building, uh, which in 1952 we traced they had taken off the lime render and they actually put back in cement pebble ash, which to do cement pebble ash is it's a liquid that you mix and you throw it at the building. And it's about one part cement and one part pebble. So it is pretty hard. And we weren't sure how we were going to get it off here, but we did have to really remove it. Um, <clears throat> So, um, so what we just dis discovered from the earlier photograph, uh, this was um, taken before the 1894 change, and it was that the original line was hard. Is that a term here? It's where you do throw the line and you get this nice rough cast um, line finish. We wanted to repeat that. So uh, we, we wanted to do tests to see how we could do that. We also did analysis on how to remove the cement. I'm afraid that was just uh, kind of hard labor. <laughs> and, 
uh, getting it off there. And then uh, we knew that the stone underneath this facade would be um, kind of undulating and because it was always built as a rough, uh, you know, kind of random rubble wall that was always meant to be covered. Um, <clears throat> We decided, and we've been working again in, in Benedict Warren, but also in other projects in Dublin, with this product called diapathonite, which is the one that's lime mixed with cork. And it's made in Italy and distributed around Europe. And uh, we actually worked with Dyson, who are the company that make it, and they have a very good kind of laboratory as well. And we did tests over there, tests of Trinity. Um, to see how this was a going to adhere to the stone that we had, b um, this product can only be applied by trowel, so we wouldn't be able to get the roughish finish that we wanted. So we wanted to then finish it off with a dash of, of lime and sand uh, to give the the. Uh, yeah, then we wanted to know how long that was going to last, etc. So we did a lot of uh, kind of testing and accelerated weather testing on it, um, but it all worked out extremely um, well. This is some of the works then. Um, this is the rough wall underneath uh, the line. Uh, if you remember, there were stone surrounds of every window in the original, and then they put in the 1950s. They just seemed to chop it up. We don't know why, but we weren't willing to put it back um, because it had um, <clears throat> So we discovered a, a, lots of different interventions. Some concrete heads had gone in, but we left them. Uh, and, uh, and, and then, as I say, we, we did um, this finish work by Wexford Sound, which we were able to identify from some of the early uh, bedding mortar. This is on the left. Uh, first coat going on, and you have to leave it uh, between, depending on weather, three to five days before you put on the second coat. The second coat, we, we felt we needed a bit of a reinforcing, so we actually used a, a, a hessian um, uh, reinforcing on it. Um, we don't like using uh, plastic or things like that because they just disintegrate. From a, a thermal efficiency point of view, we then have a different team that does all the stuff inside. Uh, and they mainly come from building physics and background. But again, we've invested in the equipment to do the sorts of evaluation that we want to because we want to do hard investigations so that we get hard data so we can share that data because. Um, when the BER was set up, they, for some reason, decided 1974, post 1974 buildings, uh, would have a calculative U value given to it, depending if it's a, a cavity wall with no insulation, cavity wall with insulation, depending on the thickness and everything. They had this calculative work, worked out. Anything older than that, like a solid masonry wall, they give default, and they decided a default of 2.2 new value. Now that's huge. Um, and in all our work with Historic Environment Scotland, Historic England, we have physically measured buildings of you know 300 to 500 mm thick. And every one of them will come well within two points. <laughs> so by using the BEOR system, tick box system, we're actually putting more insulation on than we need to, uh, which means we're using more carbon to you know upgrade a bit. So it's important that we, we learn uh, you know what can you learn. This is a, a simple in, indoor, uh, indoor uh, air quality monitor that we record before we do anything. We are now back if this job is just finished before handover. But we're also, we've allowed for a post-occupancy evaluation of it too over the next three years. So we can get uh, exactly what's performing, how's it performing, is it as good as we said it was? 
is it not? You know, and, and we've got to learn that now. So <clears throat> this is the air quality. Then this is our in situ. We've invested in four of these machines um, and we stick something, as I say, on the outside, on the inside, and then we can actually monitor it back in our office um, because we use a modem um, to, to feed the information. And we, we do this for a minimum of seven days. The one criteria is that you must have a differential temperature outside to inside. And whether that's hot outside and cold inside or vice versa, it doesn't matter. We can still then measure um, the actual view value of these walls. Um, <clears throat> I'll come back to that. We also like to know the porosity of the building, and this is the font which obviously we can't change. Um, but these are simple, what's called Ryland tube tests, or I think they're described as initial moisture uptake tests. And it's a simple plastic um, tube. It's calibrated uh, zero up to about 2.5. And then you, you stick it on with blue tack, you fill it up to zero and you time when, how much the water goes, soaks into, into the substrate. And then we have uh, a working document that we then uh, analyze that and it tells the exact porosity of it. And as you can notice, we do some of them on the brick because it's a fired product and it would be much less porous than the mortar, but we do some of them across the mortar. So then we will take a square meter and extrapolate the overall porosity of like that square meter, not just of the brick or not just of the Whereas a lot of calculated um, tools, software, will just take the uh, porosity of the brick and not take into consideration the home. Um, <clears throat> we uh, have access to the geology labs in Trinity. And this is the stone from the back of the building. We didn't know if it was um, continuous, whether there was a slight cavity, or sometimes they built a stone on the outside of the brick on the inside. And then fill the middle with Mason's mortar. Um, but in fact, it was stone all the way through. So, again, by doing the uh, petrographic analysis, we were able to get the porosity, the continuity, and, and everything on, on, on stone. That stone is no longer available in Ireland because, um, well, Jeff was no longer the town of Rack Mines is built on the quarry. So, you can't get it anymore. Uh, we always insist on condensation, as you know, because this is one of the biggest risks uh, in doing an energy upgrade of the mode of order. And <clears throat> again, it, it's, um, it, sorry, Passivate is, um, is a guy called Andrew Lundberg, who um, just works for himself, and he does all his work through us, but um, for tax reasons and other things. Treats himself as a soldier, but he's, he's he does I think ninety eight percent of his work through Perry. And we then using uh, obviously uh, models of buildings or, or you know three D models particularly. And uh, this particular project actually was a BIM project, so self common with it, and um, <clears throat> which it has to be a certain size project to to afford BIM, but uh, it gives you great information. So we look at where are all the likely um, weak points uh, for cold bridge, thermal bridge, and we can then address those in our specification. And we were very lucky that we had um, a, um, a void at the bottom. It was a, a, it was a, a, tim a suspended timber floor that we had, so we took up the floorboards. And there was about a 500 mil void with clay just underneath. So we used a geocell, it's called it's a recycled glass insulation, which is really good. And it's easy to use. And we compacted it to about 300 mil. And then we left a 200 mil gap between the timber and the bottom of the mill. Floorboards and uh, opened up the original pair of fence that was locked up at the time. And we measured the, um, we measured the, the uh, insulation of the whole thing, but also 
when we opened, we actually forced Samara through to do a test on uh, did that have any, any effect on reducing the insulin of um, packaging. It was negative, so we, we were happy with that. And that means there's air movement and we don't get timber rot or anything else. And <clears throat> other kind of research and mentioned the climate change adaptation implementing stage now. We did this study, but it, it's, it's too long to go into, but again, I'll make it available. And this was commissioned by Historic England. And it was to try to understand uh, carbon in the built environment. And effectively, what we did was we took a fairly simple bit building, like a um, house with <coughs> a nation street kind of meet anybody's interest. But it was those type of houses, ter terraced red brick from around 1900-ish. And <clears throat> what we did was we, we got one example and we went in and we evaluated the carbon within that building and the use of that building. And the, it had an oil-fired heating system. So the operational energy is going up. Um, but the carbon, what we call the embodied carbon within that building that was built over 120 years ago is well spent. And therefore, the building is carbon neutral. The, the, the materials are carbon neutral. So we evaluated that. We then did a light energy upgrade, introducing just simple measures like insulating the attic, insulating the floor, upgrading the windows, upgrading the door, but not introducing any other insulations to the walls. And we managed to improve um, the thermal performance of that building by about 30, 35%. That allowed us to put in a heat pump, which then brought the operational energy down. So that was, we reckon that was from, it, it, it's, it's funny that it's almost identical that our, our cost consultants did analysis on the two. And <clears throat> it was going to take about five years to pay back the investment that, to upgrade that home. And it was gonna take about five years to negate the carbon that we introduced into the building, such as the insulation in the roof, the insulation in the floor. Um, and, and that we felt was the best scenario. When we did a deep energy retrofit, it came out and went up to about 15 year payback for the investment, but also for trying to uh, negate the carbon because we did use some insulations on internal walls in that case. But in fact, the back wall was rendered, so we used uh, a, a new wrap in the back, which is the core wall. But then the front wall we put on the silica board, which I mentioned earlier, on the inside, because it's thin, and because there was some corner something, you know, so you didn't want to lose that. So, um, and that worked out at uh, about 15 years. Then finally, and um, virtually, we demolished the building. We measured the embodied carbon, the trucks that it took to dump it on the dump site. And then we built it with modern technology, con concrete, concrete blocks, brick, glass, steel. And we measured that it will take 63 years to pay back the carbon uh, in that scenario. So, that's a really good argument for um, the retention of values and the sensible adaptation of values. Um, again, that study is, is in the public domain. Um, and we're now doing a, a study for both. It's, it's a joint uh, kind of fund uh, from Historic England and from the Department of Housing and Ireland, um, where we're trying to put a value on input to conflict. And, and there's a number of companies, Arabs, I think, have one um, where they're doing carbon calculators, which kind of tells you what the carbon value is. What we're trying to get to is, and what we feel is really necessary, is a life cycle carbon analysis tool that is suitable for existing buildings. 
At the moment, there are many, many LCA tools out there, but they're all designed for you. And if you take, try to adapt them, uh, how do you value the carbon that's there, uh, etc.? So <clears throat> we're working with a, a couple of, well, actually one university and um, an organization in the UK called the Sustainable Traditional Building Alliance. Um, and um, we're trying to develop an LCA tool specifically for what we're calling system builders. Um, and um, we're kind of about a third of the way through that. We hope if we get the follow on funding, that it, it, it'll become real in 2020. Um, we mentioned the, the guidelines. The two latest ones that we've uh, kind of won uh, is called Smart Lab, um, which is taped on the screen. Um, and it's a well, let's start here. European Green Deal was signed off last, um, yeah, late last year, where the Euro EU have put up about 198 million to help governments implement grant schemes for the energy upgrade of our buildings. And um, it's beginning to get pace. Um, and it's great to have that sort of support. This is the one understanding carbon was published in, um, in, in this is a, a kind of an annual by um, Historic England and it, it's called uh, Heritage Counts. Um, and, um, and then we're also involved in just finishing up a study where we're working on smart cities, trying to make cities uh, more carbon neutral or less carbon dam damaging. Um, <clears throat> but the smart lab one is Irish, it's funded by the Irish government and it's working with Limerick City and County Council and the University of Limerick. And what we're doing is looking at a whole historic quarter of Limerick. Um, and that blue line is the River Shannon running through, going out to sea. Um, but we've got over 100 houses, uh, mostly Georgian, uh, but they vary from two-story to three-story of the basement, some commercial buildings. And <clears throat> we've got fantastic sign-up from the owners of those buildings. And we're going to be putting in these wonderful widgets. <laughs> I'm a great man for widgets. Um, but this is a, a, a sensor that we put on the energy source in each house. And then we can monitor that in the office on you know, when you boil the kettle, when you have a bath. <laughs> it's a big brother watching. But anyway, everybody signed up to it. We don't share any of the information except with the house owner. And we go back to him and say, well, look, if you didn't have six cups of tea and boil the kettle six times on the day, you could save up to 10% of your energy. And what we're trying to do is get community and, and occupation buy-in to being conscious of what they're doing and how they can actually, you know, by simple matters, reduce. Now, another part of the program which we're, we're much more involved in is we've got a, a, a sample of five case studies where we're going in and doing uh, different insulation systems, looking at each house, doing the new values, doing uh, uh, kind of fit out. And this is all being funded by this program. So people are getting their houses upgraded for free. Effectively, except that they might have to move out for three or four weeks, but mostly can organize holidays or go and annoy a relative for something. Um, so, and then they'll move back into a much more comfortable house. The only deal that we do with them is we have to monitor for five years uh, offline. So um, we'll go in about three times a year and take readings from some of the information that we put in. Um, so that's really interesting. And Fab Trav is uh, trying to make traditional versions. I don't know who comes up with these titles. But, um, anyway, that's working with University College Dublin. And what we've done is identified 50 
typologies of solid wool masonry uh, in, I think it's four different countries, so that we're getting climatic differences as well. Because if, if you're designing an insulation for an island, which you know, kind of usually doesn't below, go below zero, very seldom goes above 20. And so, so this is our summer on the right here. Then, but um, <clears throat> if you then go to Spain where it's getting up to 40 degrees, does that insulation have a, a negative effect on, on the fabric or indeed the occupants? So what we're trying to do is, so we're doing, uh, we're going to actually take actual new manual readings of these 50 different typologies. And that's going to form the very start of a major database that people can then go in and take the function to move forward. <coughs> We're trying to convince um, particularly the Spanish government to allow us to do one upgrade and so that we can see how that performs in the different climatic and the situation. And <clears throat> just to finish on a a couple of adaptive reuses uh, that we've been involved in. <coughs> this is a, a church actually dating from 1720, actually designed by the same guy who uh, just did uh, Thomas Bird. <coughs> remember that. But it was a uh, Church of Ireland. Um, the congregation started falling in the late 60s. So they amalgamated in uh, parishes. And they closed this church, and in the 1980s, kids broke into it and set fire and you know, burnt everything basically inside. And, and <clears throat> for those architects in the audience, this is Derek Tynan, my friend and architect, and he's probably standing in the back of my garden now, looking at, at this uh, in, internal garden. We discovered when we opened, you can see we did some investigative work, but um, we found a complete um, crypt underneath this church with numerous um, kind of vaults. And there were burials from 1700 in there, so we couldn't touch it really. Um, so we had to come up with an idea of what we were going to do. Um, we always felt that residential use in here would be extremely difficult because of the shape of the building and also getting rid of services and everything. So we went for an office building and that's what it's like today. And <clears throat> because the crypt was underneath this floor, we specially designed and commissioned these um, trusses that rest on the original wall, but actually hang the two upper floors. Uh, so there's no weight transfer onto the ground. And um, it's one of about eight different European wars. But, um, and we also uh, did a lot in uh, energy conservation on this. And we got it to a B3, which is pretty good for older building. And the people that are now in the office, um, Derek and I were kind of hoping we might have been able to afford to move in there, so <laughs> we weren't. Um, and then I mentioned the Climate Heritage Network. They're really a good organization. They're doing pretty good stuff and, and, and uh, you know, kind of, uh, they have a good website, so it's worth going on to, to look at that. Um, so that's me. Thank you very much. And I hope, oh, sorry, wrong one. I thought I had a lovely photograph of, I got yellow tape made up especially, and it's called um, No Entry Climate Crime Scene. <laughs> <laughs> and a steep of demolished building. <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was on this one, but um, so that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do, do we have any questions or comments from? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll start. I was really interested to hear that the building sort of terraced house typology, the Coronation Street um, from around the turn of the 20th century, you're saying is paid back its carbon and is effectively 
a carbon neutral building now? And what is is there a, is there a particular period or length of time mm. where you consider that, or does it depend on the building type and construction? Not really. We 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 kind of say now that any solid masonry, and that's different here because you've got timber buildings. We'd have to look at that separately, but. For a, a masonry solid wall construction, we say it's well spent its carbon by the time it reaches 60 years. Oh, okay. and, and we've even looked at some early concrete buildings of that age, and they're pretty similar, oh, even though concrete so. is, is one of the high environmental to, to manufacture. But it's quite a relatively short period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, so we're usually told that for energy efficiency, we want to increase air time. But I think you were saying that for heritage buildings, that's not necessarily the case because there's an issue with it's not. Time. And in fact, if you if you do completely strangle the building uh, for memory movement, it's the worst thing you can do to an older building. Um, yes, you know, decrease air loss or heat loss, but not. Do not, please do not put the air membrane uh, around the building or anything. It's the wrong thing to do to the water. Even if you ventilate it? Uh, Ventilation is the most important thing, you know, but then you're going to be weighing up how do you ventilate through an airtight membrane? <laughs> and, you know, you're going to get weak, weak points. Um, we just don't think, and, and I know there's a kind of move um, or mute, I suppose, where we should be making older houses equal to passive houses. So that is not A, not achievable, B, not advisable. Yeah. And again, it depends on, on the fabric of the building. If you've got a, a soft natural stone, you know, like we do a lot of assessments on, on churches and um, you might know of the city of Bath in England. It's got this beautiful kind of funny limestone, but it's got a porosity of about 28%, and, and it's really soft. And, it, and you know, if you entrap moisture within in, anywhere near that, the stone is just going to decay at an alarming rate. And so you've really got to, to weigh up the two. No, we would not um, say go and make it air, an older building air to point. Yes, improve the air movement, but ventilation is the key to it. And whether that's natural ventilation, what we're doing a lot now is, um, you know, we might be making windows more air touch, but we're actually ventilating through old chimneys that are no longer used. Um, and that's a, a, a kind of a um, it's, it's an automatic kind of stack <laughs> which bring, bring, yeah, can create a movement. So sorry, if you, if you activate the chimneys in that kind of way, is there some sort of um, clever EMS way? Like usually, usually yes. yeah. it, it's a simple cow on the roof that will activate in, in that, but it, it uses so little, and it's usually driven by wind action. Yeah. Question about the um, last church you showed. Yeah. Um, where was it, or where can I find it? <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's actually called Saint Luke's. It's in the um, Liberties in Dublin, which is a very old part of the city, right in the city centre. And um, if you want to get my email. It's not still there, but if you want to get my email, I can send you a link to some, some of the stuff. That, for instance, our report that we did on it, if you want. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's some questions, I think, from the question. Uh, one, one was more of a, a query or a comment to uh, one of the audience members was um, interested to hear more about how the buildings are performing following the upgrades uh, in comparison to the predicted energy efficiency ratings. I, what is the performance gap looking like? It's looking good at the moment, but we're very early in the analysis. Um, the oldest building that we have actually upgraded 
we're only monitoring for about two years and so we've got kind of four seasons or eight seasons um, <clears throat> and it's performing incredibly well. Um, but we have set a minimum of three years, a maximum of five years to get really proper you know, kind of information and data. And again, that will be shared. You know, when we and that leads into probably the next question, which is uh, whether any of the research conducted on the U values of solid masonry uh, walls is available anywhere. Not yet, but the Fab Trad one that we're doing is a publicly funded project. That's an 18 month program. It started in September, so it'll be kind of spring 2024 when it'll be published. And it'll be mostly on the UCD. University College Dublin website, but it will also be on the online site. And this one is a little bit long. But, uh, <laughs> uh, in the interest of sourcing materials locally, such as NHL limes, which are not produced in Australia, and we must import them from Europe. Uh, however, quick lime is available here, although it comes with curing complications in our hot and marine environments. Peter, do you have any experience using hot mixed limes in your testing? And if so, is there a measurable difference? Yes and yes, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, I think using hot lime, you have to have somebody that is really used to working hot lime. If you give it to an ordinary kind of plasterer, let's say, with all due respects, um, you'd make a complete hash of it because he would be applying it too quickly, too thinly, and then not allowing it to um, carbonate enough. And that's what they're talking about within uh, sometimes what we've done, and, and, uh, and it's, it's perfectly accepted, um, is where we add a brick dust into the hot line, which acts as a pulsomatic, so it speeds up the process of carbonation. Um, but it does discolor the line. It's, uh, but you end up with a nice um, kind of line where one famous actress, what's his name, who bought a castle down in Cork, Jeremy Irons um, you used a, some sort of a, print, a, a pink sandstone to mix in with his lime. He, this kind of 11th century castle, he rendered the whole thing, and it's now known as the pink castle. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, question. Is there some sort of about, you know, the, the terrace house being or even the new building you said, if it replaced the new concrete building would be 60 feet, three years to pay back. Is there some sort of metric and you were sort of using the metric too that in five years, if you did the low key intervention, it would be paid back and the more intense intervention would take 15 years to pay back. What's an accepted rate of material use per year? Is, that, is there some? Well, if we're... Well, what we're trying to lead towards is, and I really don't want to get on my high horse about passive houses, but most of the evaluation of um, interventions are based on operational energy, and they do not take into account two things. One, embodied carbon, which is and, you know, the material that's already in a building, but then the embedded carbon, which is the valuation of carbon that you're introducing in your upgrade. So, as I say, if you were to take one of those houses, we, we used low carbon solutions and it was 15 years. If you use polystyrene insulation, for instance, that would move out to about 40 years. Um, and then you get penalties at the end because the likes of polystyrene is not recycled, whereas you know, wood fiber wood is or uh, other products are, you know, and, and that's what we're trying with the life cycle analysis to, to get the whole life cycle. So we're calling it actually, instead of cradle to grave, it's cradle to cradle. <laughs> so it's, it's a full end. And that then leads into a whole other area that's really gaining um, kind of momentum in Europe is the circular economy. Should we be designing our buildings that are 
the amount of them to move, to uh, reuse, to whatever, you know. Um, <clears throat> and then, so it's really looking at, at the low carbon, but just going back to a passive house, you know, they only take in the account of operational energy. They do not look at the uh, embedded carbon that they're using in the products that they build the building with. And if they use an airtight membrane, which they do, that's made from a plastic or a rubber, and that's perishable. And it only has a life cycle of about 20 years. So what do you do? Take the facade off, remove your air tightness to put it back, or it becomes uh, ineffective. Um, so they're not taking into account the, you know, the full life cycle of upgrading. You know, they use triple glazed windows, which are often air gone or gas filled. But if, if the gaskets start failing, which they will, the gas leaks and they're, and they're not effective after 15, 20 years. So I think we really have to get to looking at a low carbon solution for our buildings. And timber buildings are ideal, you know, but unfortunately the older ones here are not insulated and therefore they're, they're cold. But if we could come up with solutions to, um, you know, retrofit in certain installations in the building, they should be fine. Now, Jeff, I mean, Jeff, you had a question. Yeah, look, I was going to ask you, um, Peter, if you could just talk a teeny bit about um, the uh, book that's going to come out later on about what's, what's in that and why it is useful to folk who have um, uh, heritage um, uh, or traditional buildings. And could you maybe just talk a little bit about the concept of a, um, you know, uh, a building's uh, materials passport for those particular things there? Because um, I think my, my view is having seen the, the kind of early drafts on that, um, this is a document that we really, really need in Australia, but obviously designed around the building typologies and and types of construction that are in Australia. But the rigor in which has gone into that, I think, is the kind of detail that we actually need. A visual picture of what, what's going to be in it, if you don't mind. It's a, it's a huge document. It's about 180 on the pages. Um, and we've, we've tried to break it down in kind of sections, but also sequence, if you like. So the first thing is a whole two pages, I think, on understanding your building. So doing the investigative work of, you know, knowing that you've got a solid wall masonry, whether that's stone, brick, a combination, or whether it's, you know, and then some older buildings in the west of Ireland, they're just mud walls, um, you know, and, Ironically enough, they perform much better than a modern interior. Um, and then it goes into understanding the heritage value because that's really important. We do not want to compromise the heritage value. And then it gets into more the options of, um, you know, and, and we have a kind of a matrix that you, you know, go step one and two and then you hop over into three if you get positive, and then you do three and four, and then hop back to five, and so on. But somewhere you'll meet a stop, and it'll say, you can't do it on this building. And we think that's important as well, is that we're not trying to drive people to do something on every building, but will be the buildings. And a bit like climate change, you know, we have to accept that we're going to lose some heritage um, sites because of climate change, particularly on, on children's. But then we go into uh, the choice of, of products and we've listed a number and we, we can't, because it's a government document, we can't say you must use this product because then we're accused of being in the manufacturer's pocket. But, so what we try to do is we put a much more technical, so if it's a wood fiber board, we will explain how that's made so that it's not just identified with one supplier. 
Um, <clears throat> and then we look at the whole um, heating or cooling. And, and you know, parts of Europe are beginning to get very hot <laughs> for that to really think of the cooling. Um, and then we also then go into uh, the energy source and do we uh, you know, use renewables? And what I didn't feature on the rubrics building is in the garden behind it, we put 21 thermal boreholes and we're supplying about 75% of the energy onto from a renewable source, um, which is just boreholes in the garden. And then the gardens redone and and, 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 and then <clears throat> um, what's the final kind of it's really the, and then it, into kind of the, the choices of cost and how you know, and, and then also the cover and this is the only movable point and we kind of didn't want to include this in the document but it, it goes through the various grant systems that are available because they're changing all the time. And so, um, so it's, a, it's a fairly meeting. What I could do, I, I, I can't share the document with you because it's not published yet. But what I could do is share the content of this, um, you know, which would give you a better idea of the explanation. Now, last question, I think. Yes. Um, yeah, you brought up this LCA tool for heritage buildings that you're developing. Could you speak a little bit more to how it works? I'd, I'd be interested to know sort of what the user inputs and what kind of information that you're getting out of it. If I knew my tech, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty early on. And what we've done as you know, heritage experts and energy experts, we've kind of set a number of tasks. And it's now with um, uh, uh, I pulled the kind of computer nerd that is off in some room somewhere trying to come up to make them all work. And, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to be a simple tool to do at concept design stage. We do not want it to come out halfway through a design process because then after this too late, you've made decisions. You know, and so this hopefully will even, um, you know, kind of, what would be the like promote the the geometry of the building, really. the orientation is important, but sometimes you can't do that. The first green building that I got involved in, believe it or not, was in 1994 when we designed uh, that green building in Temple Bar in Dublin. And it was an infill site in a medieval streetscape. Now, uh, luckily, there had been in the 1950s concrete building put on. In 1994, we looked at taking the concrete down, crushing it, and reusing it. But Ireland didn't have a crusher, so we'd have to send it to Belgium and bring it back again. So we didn't do that, <laughs> which was a shame. But at least it started a process, and now there are even on-site crushers that you can get to come to site to crush your, your state. Um, but we, we did, we used uh, geothermal there. We had three wind turbines on the roof. We had both attacks on the roof. We had uh, heat evacuation tubes on the roof. And we generated 94% of the energy in the building. Now, sadly, in Ireland, when you get um, kind of a, a windy day and a sunny day, <laughs> and you can get both together, we're overproducing. And at the time, the state energy supplier was only one, and they were charging about 12 pence per unit at the time to buy electricity. They offered us one penny to take it back, and they just didn't want it, basically. But we weren't ready for that. And so what we did actually was put a bloody big battery in the basement, and we stored seven days of electricity. Uh, from overproducing on the building and then released it back in the days that we weren't producing. Anymore. And it balanced out and it was a fantastic exercise. Now the battery is totally non-environmentally friendly, but it, it was an exercise. Again, it was a funded project from Europe uh, and we learned from that. And in, that was 1994. In 2004, um, Terry Farrell, architect in London, and came and heard of it and wanted to see it. 
And he designed a building in Manchester, which was based on the model of that. But of course, in Manchester, they could put up a point build at a much better rate. And, um, and since then, somebody else has done one in London. But at least it, it's a learning curve that's moving on. And, and I think that's, we have to look at the holistic uh, approach to it. Um, but we let you know when we have it sorted. It will be open source yeah. because it's 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 jointly well it's jointly funded by the Irish government and uh, historic England, so it will be open source. Peter, thank you very much. Been really fantastic, stimulating uh, uh, presentation and also discussion, and clearly of great uh, interest here locally. I think it's uh, a topic which all heritage ag agencies across Australia are. Uh, keenly interested in, but not necessarily knowing where to go. Uh, and there's a lot of work, I think, that can be done locally by universities, by heritage practitioners, and by experts that are out there. I was going to ask my last question. Do you know who's the Australian equivalent of you? <laughs> there isn't even an Irish equivalent. Right, right. <laughs> so, but, I mean, it sort of shows you that there's an opening, I think, for the more material science within the university system Absolutely. in Australia, most definitely. It may not be within our, our faculty, but certainly. Well, actually, Philip, if I can just um, make one other uh, thing. We won about two months ago, we were informed, the Irish government and the Minister for Higher Education brought in the heads of the six architectural schools in Ireland and said, I want you to work together. I want you to rewrite your curriculum and I want you to include sustainability, heritage conservation, and climate change in your curriculum. And they've just now agreed terms, and we're about to start that when I get back. Fantastic. And I think that's a, a that's really forward step. Tell you our colleagues. You know, I reckon you could partner with you know, folk from um, the engineering schools or yeah. your science and things like that. I think. A lot of the skills that you need are actually within the um, uh, University of Melbourne. It's really about joining up, uh, joining it up, explaining what the need is, and kind of putting it in. You know, getting that together because I think that's what you've done. You've taken your kind of core, if you like, um, chemical engineer experience. You've teamed it up with a passion for for buildings, and I think it's that's about. All the problems can be solved within the built environment and so on with both architectural, historic, and then analysis skills. Yeah. Well, I think it's, a, it's an area where the industry is actually further ahead. So I can talk about these things with my colleagues in industry, yeah. but not necessarily within the academy. I think the issue mm -hmm. at the moment. So Peter, thank you again. It's been very stimulating. So let's thank Peter Collins.